Hi guys, uh, welcome to Hearing and Equilibrium. So uh, let's get the ball rolling here and go through this. So first things first, hearing is a response to vibration in the air around us, whereas equilibrium is uh, your, you have mechanoreceptors in your inner ears in particular that allow you to perceive your body's place in space. All right, so where your system is, how your head is oriented, uh, this is picked up by your equilibrium senses. Again, that we typically associate with your inner ear structures. Both hearing and equilibrium deal with different areas of your inner ears. Now, both of these structures, both sets of these, uh, are fluid-filled passages, and this is very important. The way that the fluid moves, the way that the fluid in the inner ear vibrates, it's very important to the function. Uh, we can actually augment this mildly. You probably have noticed that someone who is intoxicated they may not have the greatest equilibrium on earth and that's because alcohol in the system uh, plays games with the fluid in the inner ear and makes it uh, where it's not as it's, it doesn't function the way it's supposed to function so you end up with uh, equilibrium being thrown off I imagine the fluid in your ear moving around not unlike if you have a full stomach so if you drink a lot of fluid you kind of move around a little bit you can feel it slosh from side to side that's the same way on a, on a macro scale as the micro side of, of your inner ears being filled with fluid. So the movement of this fluid is very important. All right, now, the nature of sound. If we were in space and we were side by side, could I yell at you and have you hear me? And the answer there is no, because there's no medium through which sound can travel. There must always be a medium through which vibrations can travel for you to have the capacity to perceive sound. So like when a dog barks or when I hit this table or anything along those lines, what I'm doing is I'm generating vibrations. Those vibrations are traveling through the air uh, and in theory at least, being captured by your ears to allow you to perceive sound waves. It's not unlike uh, dropping a stone into a pond and seeing the ripples run away from it. Uh, these are like sound waves traveling through the air to your ears. Now, the reality of the world is that uh, all sound is basically defined in two, uh, two variants. All right, Everything that you have ever heard can be broken down into what's referred to as pitch and loudness. Okay, pitch and loudness. Pitch would be is something high pitched or is something low pitched, and loudness is either quiet or loud. Everything, everything you've ever heard is some variant of pitch and loudness because the only things that your ears can perceive in terms of hearing is pitch and loudness. That's it. That's all they can do is pitch and loudness. So everything, everything you've ever heard is pitch and loudness. So that's that's the way that your ears are set up. Now, how is the ear itself uh, anatomically built? What we have is an, I'm probably going to jump ahead here, but that's fine. We have an outer ear, which is basically everything from the tympanic membrane out. The tympanic membrane being the, uh, the correct term for your eardrum, which you've probably heard before. Uh, so your outer ear is this helix and penna and lobule. So we, we have this outer ear structure is basically a funnel to capture sound waves and funnel those sound waves in through your auditory canal, right? The auditory canal being lined with what are called ceruminous glands, and I'm probably going to talk about this later, but again, I'm, I'm just kind of telling you what I think. So uh, It's lined with what are called ceruminous glands that make a fluid called cerumen that you'd refer to as being earwax. Uh, it's a waterproofing agent. It helps to keep the eardrum moisturized, keeps critters out from being able to crawl in, so cerumen is actually very important. Earwax is very important. Uh, now, the middle ear, see here, is from the tympanic membrane into the inner ear. Uh, basically from the tympanic membrane to a structure called the oval window of the cochlea. Basically all of this, okay, all of this, that's the middle ear. Primarily made up of the tympanic membrane, the ossicles, and this open space here. This is air filled. And it's important that it's air filled because it's connected to the outside world via a structure called your auditory tube or what's oftentimes coined the pharyngeotympanic tube. Okay, auditory tube I can live with. Uh, you have had your ears pop at some stage in your life. You, you get this weird pressure sensation. You kind of open your jaw in a weird way or yawn or anything, you something, and it will make your ears pop. What you do is you're equalizing the pressure between your middle ear and the outside world. Like if you're traveling and you're going up and down mountains, it changes the barometric pressure. What you're going to have is a need to equalize the pressure between your middle ear and the outer ear. And when you move your jaw in that fancy way, it opens up this auditory tube so that you have an equalization of pressure between here and the outside world. So this comes into your throat, pharyngeotympanic. It goes to your pharynx. 
Um, now, the ossicles. The ossicles are called the malleus, incus, and stapes in order. So you have, have, go from the tympanic membrane to the malleus, to the incus, to the stapes. And if I were you, I would know that. All right. Know that the uh, malleus is connected to the tympanic membrane and the stapes is connected to the oval window of the cochlea. All right. So those are the ossicles. Um, and what the ossicles do, and I'm sorry, I'm probably jumping way ahead here, but again, I just feel like telling you how this works. I think this is a good way for the video to function. Uh, what the ossicles do is they are amplification systems uh, and they are safety measures. They both amplify sound waves and they are a safety measure against sound waves which are too powerful. Uh, the essence of this is that when sound waves come into the ear, they really shake this tympanic membrane uh, which moves the malleus, incus, and stapes. And then the stapes is connected to this tiny little oval window in the cochlea uh, so little movements in the big old tympanic membrane lead to these huge piston-like pumpings against the uh, oval window of the cochlea, basically making sound waves more powerful as they come into the cochlea. Think of the malleus, incus, and stapes as an auditory amplifier. They amplify sound waves as they come into the ear, uh, and the malleus, incus, and stapes are connected to a uh, set of muscles. Long story, but they are called the tensor tympani and the stapedius, and um, when you stretch these muscles, they, they contract automatically, like, like most of your muscles have a reflex arc in this fashion. Uh, but the idea is that if sound waves come in and they are incredibly strong and they are potentially damaging to the quite delicate inner ear, uh, these muscles will pick up the stretch from these very loud movements and contract. Like if you've ever been around a very loud popping sound, uh, fireworks or even gunfire come to mind, what will happen is you'll hear a ringing in your ears. That's the malleus incus and stapes contracting to prevent, I'm sorry, the, the stapedius and the tensor tympani contracting to prevent the malleus incus and stapes from transmitting those sound waves into the inner ear. So not only is the, are the ossicles an amplifier, but they also help to negate incredibly dangerous loud sounds. This works great. It's a fantastic system. So we got that outer ear, we got the middle ear, and then there we have the inner ear. And all of this, all of this, this gives you an idea of the size. This is all inner ear. Uh, now, the inner ear is actually made up of both your equilibrium and your hearing apparatuses, apparati. What I would like for you to know is that your cochlea, your cochlea deals with hearing. All right, it starts at the oval window comes in and swirls through and then swirls back out to the round window. From oval window to round window, this is one big tube, spiral up the tube, spiral down the tube, come back out. Uh, that is the cochlea. Now cochlea, anything C-O-C-H, you've got to think uh, snail shell, it looks like a shell. Okay, like a snail shell. Now the other parts of the inner ear are called the uh, vestibule and the semicircular canals. The vestibule is kind of this back area here. And then the semicircular canals are one, two, three semicircular canals. Both of those deal with equilibrium. And we'll talk about how they deal with equilibrium when we get there. Okay, but for our purposes, outer ear collects sound waves. Middle ear amplify and protect. Inner ear uh, does what we call auditory transduction. Converts the auditory vibrations into a nervous action potential that can then travel to the brain for later interpretation. Okay. Perfect. Let's go here. Okay. So uh, this is everything I just said. We have the outer ear, pinna, helix. We have the auditory canal with ceruminous glands. We have the tympanic membrane, which is the initial site of transduction. So we're going to transduce... I've, I've got the door to my garage open and there's this tiny little fly that flew in here and it's driving me crazy, folks. Anyway. Uh, the initial side of auditory transduction, this is going to convert uh, vibrations from sound waves into motion in the malleus, incus, and stapes. Uh, that'll do. The, the main transduction side we think of is the cochlea. All right, uh, we talked about the ossicles and how they work. We talked about the cochlea. This goes through and outlines the malleus, incus, and stapes. Uh, you can see the malleus, incus, and stapes here. Malleus, incus, and stapes. And the idea is that as the... Um, uh, tympanic membrane vibrates. This vibrates the malleus, which then vibrates the incus, and then vibrates the stapes. The stapes being connected to the oval window, which shakes. Here's the oval window that sends sound wave vibrations through the fluid of the oval window, through what's called the scala vestibuli tube. 
around what's called the helicotrine, that's the end of the cochlea, and then back through the scala tympani and out the round window. Uh, basically, what I need you to know here is that fluid is non compressible, so uh, you can't, it's non compressible, you can't comp compress fluids. Uh, there has to be somewhere for the fluid to go as the vibrations pass through this tube of the cochlea. And the idea is that the oval window where the stapes is, you send the sound wave in, and the round window here is the exit. It's another membrane. So when you push in the one side, it, it, the, the sound waves come out the other. So it's kind of like this. Imagine if I had a tube with a membrane over each side. If I push in, it's going to balloon out the opposing side. It's a weird way to say it all, but that's how this works. All right. Think about a waterbed. If you've ever sat on a waterbed, you sit on one corner and the other side sticks up. That's how this functions. It's fluid filled, fluid filled, fluid filled. You know, sometimes you run across these uh, cartoons and you just got to include them. I invite you to pause it and give it a read. It actually is a good way to look at this. Um, let's see. Okay, now then we're on to the actual function of a structure called the organ of corti. And I'm sure I've got it on here someplace. Organ of corti here. Okay, there it is. The organ of corti. What I want you to know at this stage is that the... Um, cochlea deals with hearing, right? The cochlea deals with hearing, and the actual neural structure inside the cochlea that allows you to transduce sound waves into nervous action potentials, the actual nerve in there, no, 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 the actual neural apparatus in there is called the organ of corti. And the organ of corti is set up in a really wild way. The way that this functions is pretty neat. Uh, and I want you to see that. So what they, they're showing you here is uh, they've took a slice out of the cochlea and they're showing you little pieces of the tube network that runs through the organ of corti. And if you take one little piece of that out and look at it, it looks like this. If I come in here and I take this little piece out, it looks like that. So what you see here is scala vestibuli and scala tympani. Scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and in the middle is the scala media. Scala media. Uh, what we have is the organ of corti inside the scala media, and here is the part that matters, okay? One, the organ of corti is long, man. It runs the entire length, the entire length of the cochlea. The entire length of the cochlea has uh, the, the organ of corti, sometimes called the spiral organ, but it's the organ of corti. It runs down the whole length of this thing, and the organ of corti is connected to a very special structure called a basal membrane. Okay, the basilar membrane seen here. The basilar membrane will vibrate with sound waves. Okay, so we've got your inner ear. This is this, this is the parts that you need to know. We've got your inner ear. Your inner ear contains a cochlea. That cochlea contains the organ of corti. And the organ of corti is the main phototransduction, I'm sorry, auditory transduction site. Now, how does it work? Well, the organ of corti is long. It runs the entire length of the cochlea, and it's anchored down to a basilar membrane. So we get this basilar membrane, and what it has here are structures called hair cells. These hair cells, both outer and inner hair cells, hair cells, hair cells, they come in and they stick to this very special membrane called the tectoral membrane. All right, let me check the next slide. All right, let me just describe to you how this works. Which slide do I want to use? Let's use this slide because it's here. Okay, what will happen here is when sound waves come through, they vibrate the uh, basilar membrane. It's very simple. When sound waves come through, they cause the basilar membrane to vibrate like this. All right, it's no different from me like blowing across this paper. Like, I can make it vibrate. Uh, as this happens, as it vibrates, it moves these hair cells around. So they're bucking like this, okay? They're moving and moving and moving. The hair cells themselves are moving as the basilar membrane is moving, just like this. But the trick is that the tectoral membrane is not connected to this whole structure. The tectoral membrane is secondary, and it remains as an anchor. The hair cells have what are called stereocilia, stereocilia, that would be sound hairs, that stick up into the tectoral membrane. So that when this basilar membrane's flopping around 
and it's moving these hair cells up and down like this, the stereocilia get bent as they move against the tectoral membrane. The hair cells bend as they move against the tectoral membrane. And the essence of what happens here is, when you bend the hair cells, it opens a set of gated ion channels that allow potassium to enter into the hair cells. When potassium enters the hair cells, sets off an action potential, travels to your brain via a nerve called the vestibulocochlear nerve. All right? Vestibulocochlear nerve. You should know that for lab. Very important that you realize that the vestibulocochlear nerve carries uh, sound and equilibrium signals out from the inner ear. And then you need to ask yourself, to what lobe of the brain would that travel? For, for instance, hearing. Hmm? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. All right, let's make sure we're together. So we've got the organ of corti. We know that it's got a floppy basal membrane, and as it flops around with sound waves, it moves these hair cells, which in turn have stereocilia, embedded in a tectoral membrane. The hair, hair cells are bent, the stereocilia are bent, uh, which allows potassium in, action potential, sends a message to your brain, you interpret this as hearing. Now, here is some reality for you. There's actually two sets of hair cells, the outer ones and the inner ones. The outer hair cells add precision to what you hear. The inner hair cells are what you deal with for actual hearing. So where does your actual hearing come from? It comes from your inner hair cells. Your inner hair cells are where you perceive hearing. The outer ones just deal with precision. So, what we have here is the cochlea. You can see, we're kind of pretend unwinding it. You can see that unwound here. Again, that should look a lot like this. Take that, and it looks like this. We have our basilar membrane here. There's the basilar membrane. Here's the oval window with the stapes. Here's the round window. We have the stapes and the oval window sending vibrations through here and then back around and out there. And the concept is that if I expose you to a given pitch, it will cause vibrations that cross this membrane. All right, vibrations that cross the membrane. That is what we're going for here. And uh, this basically allows us to perceive pitch and loudness through a very fascinating uh, way. So let's talk about it. What we have is this basilar membrane is differentially flexible. It's very rigid down here at the base, and as you go out towards the helicotrim at the end, it gets quite flexible. Imagine, man, I wish I had a little piece of plastic. Let's try the paper one more time. So imagine that if I, I pull this, oh, hang on, I see plastic. Let's steal a piece of plastic. All right. I've got a little piece of plastic here. What I can do is I can pull very tightly against this plastic and blow across it and generate a high-pitched sound. Alternatively, if I just put a little bit of tension, the sound is very low by comparison. Okay, just a little bit of tension, low pitch, really pull against it, higher pitched. I, the same idea applies to this basilar membrane. Where it is quite rigid, down here at the base, it will, um, the term is resonate, it will resonate only with very high pitch sounds. Let me say it again. Down at the base here, where it's quite rigid, the basilar membrane will only shake, it will only resonate with very high pitch sounds. As you move down the length of the thing and it becomes more flexible, the end of this, near the heel country, is really loose and floppy. And it will only resonate with very low pitch sounds. In the same fashion as the plastic, all right? I can pull it very tight and it will give off a high pitch sound when it's very hard and tight. But if it's very loose, it will only give off a low pitch sound. This is the opposite. This is perceiving that. So this will only perceive sound down here when it's very high in pitch. And then as you move out toward the end, it will only perceive sound, it will only resonate at a very low pitch. So what will happen is, if I send out sound waves and they're high in pitch, they will vibrate the basilar membrane here, which is connected to the organ of corti, which is going to shake its hair cells, moving them against the tectoral membrane, bending their stereocilia, generating action potentials. So, the question becomes, how do we perceive pitch? We perceive pitch based off of where 
on the cochlea, where in the organ of corti, where on that basilar membrane, uh, the action potentials are coming from. This whole thing is lined with organ of corti, which has uh, nerve tissue. Right? The whole thing is lined with it. So depending upon where it gets stimulated, that is how your brain interprets pitch. Which part of the basilar membrane vibrates? That tells you pitch. At the base versus at the end, this gives you high pitch versus low pitch. So, how do we perceive loudness? Well, we don't have the capacity to send strong or weak action potentials. But what we can do is uh, send more or less action potentials per unit of time. So, imagine we are vibrating the membrane here, uh, giving off a signal to the brain which says, hey, low pitch sounds are coming in from the organ of corti. If I'm just sending a few action potentials per unit of time from here, my brain is going to interpret that as a very quiet, low pitch sound. If I'm sending the same thing from down here, that's a very quiet, high pitch sound. Okay, high pitch, just a few action potentials per unit of time, quiet, high pitch. How do you send a, qu I'm sorry, how do you send a loud high pitch sound? You send way more action potentials per unit of time. Louder. Louder, okay? The more action potentials you send per unit of time, the louder your brain interprets the sound to be. And if those action potentials are virtually back to back with one another, that's as loud as you can physically perceive sound. If the action potentials have a lot of space between them, that's a very quiet high pitch sound versus a louder low pitch sound. So, how do we interpret pitch and loudness? Loudness is by the number of action potentials that arrive at the brain per unit of time, whereas pitch is determined by where on the organ of corti the sound waves are coming from. So, here's a quick breakdown of everything. Sound waves come in. If I were you, I'd listen to this like three times. Sound waves come in. They vibrate the tympanic membrane, which transduces sound waves into movement. That movement is picked up by the malleus, incus, and stapes, which is an auditory amplifier, transmitting those sound waves into the skull of vestibuli, which moves the sound waves through and around the organ of corti and eventually back out. But they might potentially cross the basilar membrane, which in turn shakes the organ of corti, and depending upon where you shake the organ of corti, that's going to tell you what pitch you're hearing, and depending upon the number of action potentials sent by the organ of corti, at that area, that will give you how loud or quiet that sound is. So that, folks, this slide, this slide tells you basically how hearing works. And that takes, it. well, let's, let's not worry so much about this. Read this, it's pretty cool, but um, that takes us to conductive deafness versus sensory neural deafness. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, the idea behind conductive deafness is that you have a problem out here. Conductive deafness is out there. There's some sort of blockage, or maybe the malleus and stapes aren't working correctly, or the overwind, or I'm sorry, the um, tympanic membrane is damaged. Something out there is causing problems. You can't conduct the sound waves into the organ of corti. In conductive deafness, the organ of corti is fine. It's everything else that's a problem. And then there is sensory neural deafness. Sensory neural deafness is when the problem's here, okay? Sensory neural deafness is the organ of corti is damaged. Sensory neural deafness is the nerve connecting to the organ of corti is damaged. All of this is fine in sensory neural de uh, deafness. It's back here where the damage is. So sensory neural is harder to fix, whereas conductive deafness tends to be pretty straightforward to fix. And that takes us to equilibrium. So if the cochlea deals with hearing, then the rest of this deals with equilibrium. The rest of this being the vestibule, the vestibule uh, here, and these three, one, two, three semicircular canals here. So the way this goes is as follows. The semicircular canals kind of deal with the rotation of your head. Think of rotation, um, angular motions, any kind of weird variations in the way that the head moves, um, angular acceleration. Whereas the vestibule deals with what we call lateral motions. Uh, so, or linear motions, you move forwards, you move backwards, you move up, you move down. The idea is that your head is basically stationary and it's moving in a direct path, all right? 
Whereas this is done by the semicircular canals. This is done by the vestibule. Now, the vestibule itself is made of two parts. The semicircular canals, there are three of. But the vestibule is made of two parts. These are called the saccule and the utricle. All right, the saccule and the utricle, seen here and there. All right, let's talk about the saccule and utricle. So, the actual organ that deals with uh, perception of, of motion by the vestibule. <laughs> let's try that again. The organ system internal to the vestibule that allows it to perceive motion is called macula. So you have a macula sacculi that's in the saccule, and a macula utriculi, which is in the utricle. Okay, saccule and utricle. And the way this works is fascinating. So the, the macula sacculi hangs, I think of it like hanging like a sac, okay? You have this macula sacculi, and the macula utriculi lays flat. So the macula utriculi kind of picks up right, left, forwards, backwards, whereas the macula sacculi picks up up and down motions, okay? So macula sacculi, macula utriculi, and inside of this, uh, what we have is the macula itself. This would be a solid base, it's a solid base, unlike the basilar membrane of the cochlea, and this is basically the same structure as the organ of corthi, which is called the macula. Uh, it's got a stable base, it's got hair cells that are embedded in a membrane, but in this case, the case of the macula, the membrane is referred to as an otolithic membrane, and it's called the otolithic membrane because it is um, positioned on top of this structure, and it has these stone-like structures on top called otoliths. So the otolith means ear stone. So it's an otolithic membrane because it's covered in ear stones. And what will happen is, as your body moves, the stones and the weight of this membrane resist changes to motion, and they kind of flop around, not unlike this pudding. Okay, not unlike this pudding. So imagine hair cells embedded in this, and they would be moving back and forth as your body moves, and as the hair cells are bent, they generate action potentials that sends a message to your brain and allows you to perceive motion. Again, macula sacculi dealing with kind of up and down motions, and macula utriculi dealing with fours backwards and left and right. This is using this otolithic membrane and the changes in inertia to perceive motion. As the membrane moves, it bends the hair cells, bends the hair cells, and allows these structures to perceive that motion. All right. Uh, compared to the semicircular canals, which again deal with rotational motions. So the semicircular canals, of which there are three, and internal to this uh, is an organ system, three total, one of these organ systems in each semicircular canal per ear would be the Christae ampullaris. So inside of each of these um, semicircular canals at the end, which is called the ampule, is a structure called the Christae ampullaris. This is here uh, with its ampullary cupola, or just cupola, at the top. Uh, imagine that as your head kind of swings around and does the things that it does, as it rotates, again, the uh, semicircular canals deal with rotation. Uh, this cupola is very tall. It's going to flop around. All right, there's fluid washing through, fluid's washing through, and as that fluid hits the cupola, it deflects it, and as it deflects, it generates action potentials. Uh, again, there are hair cells inside of this. Generates action potentials, sends a message to your brain, and tells you about rotational motions. Christa ampullaris is quite important. So, we have in the ear, the organ of corti with its hair cells and its tectoral membrane. We have in the macula, dealing with uh, linear motions, we have the macula with the otolithic membrane. And then in the semicircular canals, dealing with rotation, we have the, or I'm um, sorry, um, Christa ampullaris with its cupola, which is a gel-like membrane. And that's, uh, that's how that works. That's how that works. I tell you, I'm not terribly concerned with the projection pathways at this stage, so let's just keep it rolling. Um, This would have mattered more in lab, and I've kind of already pointed out that if we, if you drink, it can play games with the endolymph of the um, scala media in the um, organ of corti and make it not function the way it's supposed to. I'm really not that concerned. Let's go into olfaction. Okay, so olfaction is your capacity to perceive smell, and gustation is your capacity to perceive taste. 
Both of these are chemoreceptors, and chemoreceptors require chemicals in the atmosphere or what have you to be dissolved into a fluid for interpretation. In your nose, uh, you will dissolve um, chemicals in the air around you into the mucus of the upper respiratory passage in the nose, and those chemicals will then interact with special epithelium that allow you to perceive chemicals there. Uh, for taste, you will dissolve chemicals into saliva, and that saliva will then enter your taste buds and allow you to perceive flavors. So let's talk about a little bit about the nose here. All right, the top of the nasal chamber, uh, up in the top of your, your nose, we have these cribriform plates. This is inside the skull, and these cribriform plates have olfactory foramina. These olfactory foramina are little openings that bipolar neurons can reach through Again, bipolar neurons are specially set up for your special senses. These bipolar neurons connect to your olfactory bulbs on your brain, which you should know from lab. They reach through down onto your olfactory epithelium, and this is the chemical lining. This is the mucus in your nasal passages, only at the very top of your nasal passages. In fact, on what is called your superior, superior nasal conchi, or conchi, I should say, or concha, conchi. Um, we talked about these in lab as well. So we have these nasal conchi that kind of spin the air and clean it and moisturize it. Uh, at the very top is this olfactory epithelium, uh, and this is where if chemicals hit this, they dissolve into the mucus and are then interpreted by your bipolar neuron, sends a message into your um, olfactory bulbs, which then send a message into your brain for interpretation. And again, think about what part of the brain deals with your sense of smell, what lobe. All right, all right. So what will happen here is this: uh, when you are breathing normally, tidal breathing is what we call this. Air kind of comes into the nose and then down towards the respiratory path passages and allows you to uh, to breathe and, and do what you do. But if you think you smell something, you you tend to sniff, and when you sniff, it increases the velocity of air, and that air flies up and strikes your olfactory epithelium. And this is when you really perceive smells, okay? You might pick up a trace of something, then sniff a little bit, and you really perceive that smell because chemicals fly up at great speed with the increased velocity of air, and they strike this mucus, dissolve into it, and this, again, allows you to perceive smells. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say here? The thickness of the mucus matters, yeah. So uh, the mucus has to be a certain thickness. If there's not enough or if there's too much, you can't smell things. And you probably realize this. At some point, you've had a cold and realize that you can't smell anymore for a little bit of time. Um, the reason for this is very simple. When you have a cold and this mucus gets too thick, there's just too much for the chemicals to dissolve through to get to these olfactory cilia, parts of the bipolar neurons. All right, um... Smell is genetic. Your sense of smell is incredibly powerful. Some of you have a stronger sense of smell than others, and your sense of smell can be heightened through other means. For instance, it's well known uh, that for uh, like pregnant women tend to have a heightened sense of smell. All right, uh, your sense of smell you, you can perceive thousands of different odors. I mean, thousands and thousands. I've dealt with students using what we call smell kits at the University of Alabama. They had like 60 vials. They could crack them open, take a sniff and close it, crack it open, take a sniff and just go down the line and identify all of them. It's like, oh, that's baby powder, that's a lime, that's an apple. Just straight down the line. And you can really, really, with great accuracy, you'd be surprised at how good you are at it, identify piles of different odors, just piles of them. And uh, interestingly, your sense of smell, and this is very important, has a unique characteristic, something that your other senses don't do, and that is their capacity for adaptation. This is called olfactory adaptation. Now, let me explain how this works. First, let me tell you what it is, and then I'll explain how it works. So, um, you have walked into a place that has a strong or loud smell to it. I think about, like, Belk or one of these... Uh, big box stores of that fashion. You walk in and people have been spraying cologne everywhere and it just about knocks me down. But after a few minutes, you don't notice it anymore. Okay, you, the, the capacity to smell whatever it is goes away. These commercials call it being nose blind. All right. Well, the reason for this is because of olfactory adaptation. What will happen is uh, the receptors for smell deal with sodium as their primary ion. So when they open up, they allow sodium in and that's how they depolarize. But 
smelling receptors, your olfactory receptors are quite unique, and that they also allow calcium influx, and your body has a hard time dealing with that. So the essence of it is that when you allow in sodium and calcium, when you smell something, the, the sodium gets immediately pumped back out to repolarize the cell to fire again, but the calcium stays. And after a few cycles, the calcium begins to build up and build up and build up, and eventually it causes the receptors to shut down for a period of time until the body is capable of clearing out all that calcium. So if you think you smell something and you, you keep sniffing around for it, you're going to go nose blind for it and no longer be able to perceive it. And it's kind of fascinating. It allows us to be in smelly situations like a laboratory, uh, which would be nice right now to be in a laboratory, but allows us to be in smelly situations and eventually lose the capacity to be um, bothered by that smell. Now, your olfactory pathway is kind of neat. It runs through your uh, hypothalamus and your limbic system. And because it goes through your limbic system, this tends to trigger a strong emotional response. Rare is it for you to smell something and just think, oh, well, hey, there's a very neutral smell. No, normally you smell something and you're either like, oh, that's terrible, or mmm, that's delicious. Because, because... Your olfactory pathways, the way that they travel, it drives you towards things which you want and away from things that you need to avoid. It's called an immersion, or I'm sorry, um, um, oh jeez, I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, driving you away from potentially dangerous things. It's very important. That's why certain foods smell good and others smell bad. It's because it's driving you towards or away things that you may need as determined by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus, again, testing your blood chemistry to see what chemicals you require and what chemicals you do not. Uh, dogs have a better sense of smell than people, and that's pretty neat. Okay, let's move on to taste or gustation. Now, this is still chemoreception. On your tongue, uh, interpreted by your glossopharyngeal nerve, on your tongue you have these papillae. I invite you to pause the video, go to the bathroom, Look at your tongue and see all the little round dots just lining its surface. Uh, these little round dots are not taste buds, those are papillae. Okay? In particular, there are fungiform papillae, valate papillae, foliate, or what are oftentimes called thyloform papillae. Uh, these line the tongue and the actual taste buds line the papillae. Alright? The Taste buds, yeah, 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 line the papillae. So taste buds look like this. Again, oh, hang on. They're on the sides here. The taste buds look like this. Uh, the taste bud itself has a taste pore, a set of gustatory cells, and a set of basilar cells, all connected to a neuron, which then would travel to the brain. So how does this work? Well, when you're eating food, saliva dissolves chemicals into it, and those chemicals enter this taste pore to come into contact with your gustatory cells, where they are interpreted, the chemicals are interpreted, and then that is picked up by the neuron and sent to the brain. Um, what's fascinating about this is how fast these basal cells grow and reproduce and replace these gustatory cells. Turns out that your gustatory cells are, cells are replaced about every 7 to 10 days. And this is primarily because you, you damage them so often. Think about eating foods that are very cold like ice cream. That damages your gustatory cells. Think about foods that are very hot, or, or like drinking hot chocolate or coffee or something. That damages your gustatory cells. Eating a salad with vinegar on it, the acidity, damages your gustatory cells. Eating sharp foods like potato chips damages your gustatory cells. The concept is that these have to be replaced very quickly because we do so much that damages them. Not just biting your tongue, but all the other stuff here too. Uh, so we have to constantly replace and replace and replace and replace these to keep your capacity for taste functional, to keep it working. It's very important that we keep it working because, again, taste drives us towards things we want and it averts us from things that we don't need or that are potentially dangerous. Uh, let's see. So if you were to imagine picking up this Warhead candy and chucking it in your mouth and, you know, sucking on it for a second or grabbing this lemon or this lime and uh, really taking a big bite out of it, um, you might feel the sides of your tongue burn. And there's a very simple reason for this. is because different parts of the tongue actually interpret flavors at different rates. Uh, we tend to think of flavors being broken down into five parts. 
Uh, everything you've ever tasted is some derivation of sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and a uh, Japanese term called umami. It's basically a sense of savoriness. The rest of these you should be pretty familiar with. Sweet things contain sugars or saccharins or alcohols and some other things like lead sometimes, which is quite dangerous. And We'll talk more about that later. Uh, sour things contain hydrogen ions, or I should say they are acidic. They give off hydrogen ions in solution like in your saliva. Uh, those would be sour things, acidic things. Salty things containing metal ions and bitter things, can, again, like the chemical formula for the salt you eat is sodium chloride, sodium being a metal ion. Uh, bitter things containing alkaloids. Um, think of this as being like medications in most cases give us this bitter-ish flavor. Um, now, I've got my girl here. It's pretty obvious what's happening. She's got her a, a sucker, and you don't take a sucker when you eat it and like move it on the back of your cheeks or something. What she's doing is she's licking it with the tip of her tongue because the tip of the tongue uses is used for the interpretation of sweet flavors. Salty flavor is interpreted just behind that. Sour flavors along the sides and the back of the tongue being utilized for bitter interpretations. Uh, and this is pretty obvious. So whenever you uh, were a kid and you were given like uh, liquid Tylenol or something, you drink it and at first you're like, oh, this is good. I think I will consume this. And then you swallow and it gives you that terrible taste, right? A, a terrible, what we call an aftertaste. That's because you interpret sweet at the beginning. So we put a bunch of sugar in these medications. And then when you swallow, you get that bitter back aftertaste of the medicine. We play some games with this and it helps us to... Uh, get kids to take their medicine, I guess you might say. All right, uh, so let's see here. Good, good. All right, last but not least, why do we taste? Uh, the reason we taste is to drive us towards things which are good for us and away from things that are potentially bad. Uh, it's pretty obvious this can trigger uh, certain reflexes internally. So when you eat certain foods, it kind of prepares the stomach, prepares the intestines for the use of those. Um, yeah. Yeah, and this is quite protective as well. I'll never forget uh, getting an order of shrimp one time at a restaurant in near Prattville, Alabama, and I took a bite and I just spit it all out immediately. Like I, something about it told me it was there, there was a problem, and I realized you know this is my brain taking in information from the flavors there, interpreting them, and saying, hey, you got a problem, stay away. So our brain will drive us towards certain flavors so uh, that we can get chemicals that we require, potentially beneficial ones, and it will cause us to stay away from certain flavors uh, that are potentially dangerous. And that is why we taste. That's why we taste. And I think that's good enough. So let's stop there, and that's the end of this lecture. We'll be, uh, I'll be sending you another one before you know it. So expect a quiz on this stuff pretty soon. Thanks.